brothers and sisters, I believe it's time for us to make up our minds whether we're going to receive the word in totality, or partiality, or rejection. It's time to make up our minds how we are going to really receive this word and then be doers of the word of God. During these critical times that we're living in, it is important for us to make sure that we are anchored in the word of the Lord, that, our, that we have a good strong, a good foothold in the word in times like this. This text was powerful to me because uh, it deals with the response of individuals uh, that uh, listened and heard Jesus speak and minister concerning his messiahship, concerning the revelation that he had to give to the people. Interestingly enough, when you look at the time of the text, it deals with Jesus almost getting, in other words, he was preparing, um, and this was his last time at Galilee before his death. And so remember, he had taught the disciples, he had um, healed many, he had performed many miracles. And it's amazing in the text no matter what he did, still there was doubt, disbelief, unbelief. Still, no matter what he did, there was still unbelief. How many of you really know that in a day like today, it's hard to convince people you can stand on your head, and still it's hard to convince people that God is in charge and that Christ is our living Savior. I take my chances on Christ than any other entity around me. I take my chances on Christ, which he's our Savior. And so he's leaving Galilee. He was forced there because the Jews were angry with him. This was during his time of opposition. Remember, we talked about those three phases of his life, obscurity, popularity, and then opposition. Now he's in the throes of opposition strictly because of pleasing the Father and doing the will of the Father. Look at this very, very carefully in the text, the earlier part of the text. The Feast of Tabernacles was something that was instituted years, years ago, years ago in Old Testament history for the celebration of uh, the harvest. It was a time where they would set up these booths and they would move out of their houses and go in these tents and stay in these tents for about seven days. And so they would move from their comfort zones into a realm where uh, you could see how they act and how, they, you know, how their disposition was in the uh, Feast of Tabernacles. And so this was one of the feasts that was held among the Israelites. And the Bible says that it was time to go up to the feast. And here's his brothers. When you really look at the text, you will see that his brothers were very sarcastic in the text. It just seems like they're just saying to him, going up to, going up to the Feast of Tabernacles, but they were sarcastic. They had walked with Jesus, although they were, you know, they were half brothers. They also heard him declare that I'm the Messiah, that I'm the Redeemer. It's amazing in your family sometimes when you have family members that just don't even believe in your call. But of course, you have to match your call. In other words, you have to walk the walk when it comes to your call and act like you've been called. You just, it is more than just a walk around Central Park. And so they were be being very sarcastic to Jesus. And they said, well, listen, you know, you've been doing a lot of things. And now why don't you go to Jerusalem where everybody has gathered so that they can really see your miraculous works that you do. And, and, you know, in other words, they will pat you on the back and they will give you the glory for all of the things. Jesus often had to remind them, it is not my will, it's not my work, it's the Father's desire. So the brothers rejected. So here he deals with family and their rejection. Then he deals with people and their rejection. Then he deals with religionists and Jews and their rejection. 
And then there were just a few little good people that thought that he was a good man. He's just another nice man. He just cared for people. He's just so wonderful and still did not get the message of who he really was. And so the Bible says that they brought his, their, their bro the brothers did not believe. Jesus said, y'all going up to the feast. I'm not going up to the feast. Jesus was smart. That's what I love about him. I'm not going up to the feast at this time. And when you look at the Feast of Tabernacles, you will see that those seven days, on that last day, they celebrated seven times. So Jesus said, I'm going to go the last day. This is what he did. But the Bible says that he did it secretly. And so sometimes, you know, when God gives you vision, when he gives you revelation, sometimes you have to kind of keep it a secret. Because people will take it and twist it, turn it around, and make it become what they want, and then somehow destroy it, even sometimes in the minds and in the hearts of individuals. So Jesus said, that's all right, I'm going to go. It's not my time yet. It is just not time for, for, for the, the scriptures or the revelation. To, it's not my time yet. It's your time. It's your time to really get it right. Either you're going to receive me or you're going to reject me. That's just the way it is. Receive me or reject. What, is, what does it mean to receive? Accept, accept what he's saying. It's not my will, it's the Father's will. I come, I'm getting ready to die that you might receive eternal life. But if you reject, then eventually you're, you know exactly you're going to uh, reap eternal damnation. So, so reception, what are we going to do when it comes to walking with the Lord and, you know, serving in the church and doing, are we going to receive him all together? Are we going to do it partially? Are we going to do it, you know, how are we going to do that? Or are we just going to reject him or just take this part that we like? What, how are we going to do this? Jesus said you got to eat the whole book. you got to take it all. And in this text, he also refers back to Old Testament scripture to make it whole. You need to understand the law. And so the Bible says that when um, he, the Jews sought him, and then, of course, the people, there was much murmuring going on among the people. It's amazing when people don't understand the dynamics of what you're doing. There's murmuring, complaining, and why does this have to happen? Why does that have to happen? Instead of just trusting God, get in prayer and let the Lord just show you what we all are doing. Isn't that right? They start murmuring, complaining. And one of the things that they murmured and complained about was some of the things that Jesus was saying. You know, that he was saying some powerful things. He was saying, you know, that he was speaking what the Father gave him through revelation. And sometimes when you speak through revelation, it isn't always for people to understand, but, some, but I, I believe that when you're really connected to the ministry, when you're really connected to what's going on, you can understand exactly what's going on. Amen? And we know that the disciples was with Jesus, but still there was a measure of not understanding exactly what he was supposed to do and what he was supposed to accomplish. No matter what he did, no matter how much he unveiled truths to them, no matter, even during the, you know, the uh, uh, transfiguration, no matter what he did, still there was somebody that doubted what he did. And so one of the reasons, my brother on the drums, one of the reasons why they didn't like Jesus is because Jesus, you know, it's one thing when you're praying for folk and when you're healing and, you know, when people are passing out and whatever and things are going good, but when you start dealing with their sin, it's another whole ball game. Then you lose popularity. And so didn't he call the Pharisees, you know, a bunch of hypocrites? Didn't he call them that? Because he saw exactly what they were doing. And so, you know, there are times when you start dealing with sin that you lose, you know, your popularity. So Jesus said, they hate me. You know, they hate me. You know, you, you, you know they don't hate you because you, you, you go along with what's going on in the world. You know, you, you, you're, you're all right with, you know, with the little, little stuff, little sin, little sin. You're all right, you know. And you, you go on to somewhere and, you know, repent and ask your father to be the advocate for you. But when you really start dealing with people in their sin, you, don't, you, you lose popularity. So he had lost this popularity. And so the question was, in the text, if you will look at it, that they, they were marveled at what he was saying. Here he eventually he goes and he gets to the temple and he starts to teach in the temple. He's teaching them in the temple. And, and, and Reverend Moyer, there were some powerful words. I wasn't there, but I just believe he had some powerful words. Because in the text it says that, you know, this man spake as no other man spake. I mean, the words that were coming from his mouth were so powerful that it transformed my life. But I'm almost at the, at, at, the, at the point where I'm wondering, does the word really transform our lives? And then what word are you looking to hear? I mean, do you want the hermeneutics? Do you want, you know, you know, do you want all of the fancies? How do you want the word? 
I think in simplicity, it's important for us to understand the simplicity of the word. You need to be saved. You need to love the Lord. You need to understand that Jesus loves you. You need the Holy Ghost. You know, just simple words. You see what I'm saying? And so he gets to the temple and he starts teaching there in the temple, the Bible says. And they were marveled at what he had to say because they said, you know, he's from Galilee. What in the world? There's, no, there's, there's nobody good that come out of Nazareth and come out of Galilee. Isn't it amazing how sometimes we determine, you know, who's who and what God is going to do in whom and what he cannot do in other folk? And so they felt that they were, the Judeans felt that they were better than the Galileans. You've heard me say that before. And so that because sometimes people think that they're better, they reject those who they think do not have what they have or understand what they understand. And so we must understand that everybody goes through a learning process, but when you're connected to the Holy Spirit, he teaches you. He teaches you all things, and he teaches you all manner. And so Jesus says, you know, this is not my doctrine that I'm giving you. I'm giving you the word of the Lord. So if you're upset with me, that's fine. The Father mandated me tell you this. The Father mandated that either you reject me, you receive me, or you reject me. And so the Bible says that, he says, it's, it's not my doctrine. It's the Father's. He's the one that has sent me. He says, but what I want you to do, he says, I'm going to tell you how you can test yourself. I'm going to tell you how you can test yourself. I'm going to give you three points, and I'm going to take my seat. Three points about how you can test yourself in terms of uh, you saying, who you say you are. Okay? All right? One of them is, is the subjective test. This is the inward and the moral test. How can a person know if Jesus' claim is true that he's your Messiah? How can you know? He can know by doing God's will if he does what the Father says, you can take that uh, subjective test. How willing are you to subject to the will of God? And, if, and then do you know the will of God in your life? Take the subjective test because there might be some things that you might have to do that you don't want to do. There might, have, there, there might be some things that you have to take, Reverend Moyer, that you don't want to take. So then who speaks? the greatest in your life, the Lord or the old man? And then do you give in or give way to the old man rather than to the spirit of the Lord and become reactive and just, can I say this, blow your walk with God? The subjective test, that's the inward man. And so we must know his truth. He says we must know his word. We must get in his word, not just come to church on Sundays, not just go through a ritual, but this must be a personal walk with God because you're going to need him. And then, too, there's an objective test, the outward or observation test. Now, when he speaks of his own glory in your life, can you identify? Can you see the truth of what he's telling you? When he speaks into your life, you know, the, the, the outward man should really reflect what's on the inward man. And so that's why it's so careful to make sure that the inward man is all right. Because guess what? What's in you is going to come out. One way or the other. So watch what's in you. If wrong is in you, wrong is coming out. If sweet little church words is in you, if you don't watch out, guess what? Okay? All right. So you've got to look at the truth. You know, and then you've got to deal with your own truths in your own lives and deal with your own uh, nemesis, as I always say, in your own lives. So that objective test. And then there's the personal test. And this is where in the text Jesus says, now this personal test 
he confronted those religionists. Sit down, listen. Now, Moses gave the law. You couldn't even keep that. Moses gave the law, and you couldn't even keep that. This is why, let me just paraphrase. This is why I'm here as, as the Messiah. I'm here to save you who thought that you were so religious and so all put together. I'm here because eventually you're going to see that, you know, the law could not do what Christ has already done or will do in the scripture. And so he said, take the test, the personal test. Are you able to keep every law? This is why we need a savior to help us, help us should we falter, should we fail, should we not, you know, uh, meet the place or the requirement that God, then that's why we have the Lord to intercede for us to make sure, Father, forgive them, show them, you know, unveil your truths to them. That's why he died for us. So that personal test, sometimes someone else will come and tell you something that might be true about you that you don't want to receive to help you along your way. Oh, you don't have to tell me. Okay, then. And I'm just saying, you know, that, that personal test. And have you ever tried your own self in terms of, you know, some of the temperament, some of the long-suffering? These days, I've really had to deal with some long-suffering. And so I, I always talk to the Lord, and I says, you know, I will never reject the Lord. I would never reject the Lord. And so some of us who perhaps reject, you know, him when he's speaking to us, when he's talking to us, when he's definitely speaking to our spirit, when we know that our attitude is not right. I even told God, in the midst of whatever I might go through, let me not reject what you are trying to tell me and what you're trying to speak in my spirit about any situation that would go on in my life. He says to those religious, I'm the man you're looking for. You're looking for everything else. You're looking for good words. You're looking for all these cute little words. You're looking for flamboyance. You're looking for all of this. It's just in simplicity. You need a Savior. And you need the Holy Ghost. Not just conversion, because you need power to keep you. Either you reject the fact that I'm getting ready to die and be raised again so that you can have an indwelling of the Holy Spirit, so that you will have a keeper in your life in these last and evil days. It's getting critical out here. And if it was all, if at all possible, the scripture said the very elect would be deceived. And so that's why, Sister Judy, you can't get, get caught up in your own emotions. And I always told God, don't let me break in my emotions. Let me be emotionally stable so that I can handle any situation. And though the tears may fall, give me the strength to handle it emotionally and not break in the midst of the pressure. We don't know what else might happen, but I tell you what, I got my guard up. And then we got to watch what we say. You can take everything from me. <laughs> can you give me a high five on that? But I'll still love you. Now, you got to really watch that. You got to really watch that. Because when they start taking your stuff, you better know Jesus. <laughs>